Welcome to this edition of Exeter Explains and today we're going to talk about the importance of site safety culture. I'm Dr. Steve Gandy and I will take you through some of the things that we've discovered when it comes to how people approach implementing functional safety during the operation of, uh, phase of the life cycle. So in this particular case we're going to be looking at culture. Culture, this is all about having the right approach to implementing overall functional safety and, of course, process safety. Culture is endemic in the company and it always comes from the top down. And if you like, it, it surrounds the, the myths and beliefs of the company and, and how it operates. <clears throat> and so those companies that have a good safety culture are the ones that, that end up doing the right things when it comes to following through on the maintenance requirements. Management, of course, has to buy in and, and support this overall process. So the life cycle, implementing the safety life cycle, is a very important part of overall safety. And having that culture which encourages people to be open, if they see problems, if they feel things are not being done the right way, they should be able to raise those without fear of retribution. So this is all about having that right approach when it comes to how things are done. And from the site point of view, it means doing things right and doing the right things. This should be the way that we approach it. So this means that we make sure our people are properly trained, that we do have written procedures that are being followed. There have been many instances of accidents where the results where the maintenance or the operations people were not following the procedures. So either the procedure is wrong, in which case we have to modify it, or if it's not wrong, then why isn't it being followed? The use of metrics is very important for us to be able to, to track what we're doing. Remembering, of course, that the IEC 61511 is a performance-based standard. So as a performance-based standard, we need to be able to define metrics, things that we can measure, to prove that we're meeting the original design targets. If it's done right, then it's this balancing act again of, of yes, we may have some expense up front, but it saves us money in the long run. Because if we're doing the right things when it comes to maintenance and testing, then we will have less downtime as a result of failures causing false trips or worse still incidents. So these are, these are the things that we, we focus on and concentrate on. So what is a good site safety culture and what does this mean? This is important because we tend to think about culture as being a sort of a nebulous thing. But it means, from a company point of view, how well is it going to apply this in terms of encouraging and fostering this open and learning environment with the will to get things done and do them right. So that means obviously following through on maintenance repair, it applies to all the equipment, especially for safety instrumented systems. And of course, we need to be able to implement it repairs in a cost effective and efficient manner. So we need to make sure that we do this right, just rather than going through and just checking the box to say, yep, without actually really doing the work. So ensuring that personnel are properly trained is obviously a very important part of this and we need to make sure that any procedures that we have in place are being followed. If we think of it in terms of some of the fundamentals, what we do in functional safety, of course, is we use probabilistic calculations. This is where we determine whether we have sufficient defense against random failures with our PFD average calculations for low demand or our PFH for high and continuous. And we would apply this to our safety instrumented functions, of course. So part of making sure that the design meets target is doing this probabilistic analysis and probabilistic calculations. So this is all based upon a fundamental concept, which is constant failure rate during useful life. And constant failure rate can be determined based on predictive or real data over something like 200 billion unit operating hours. 
So this is, this is important because, again, if we're not tracking our useful life, when we get outside of our useful life, then we no longer have this constant failure rate that we can rely on. And of course, it all becomes very unpredictable. When we look at the life cycle and we consider the operation and maintenance, there's one box here which talks about operation and maintenance. But if you think of it in terms of the overall lifetime, in the old days we used to talk about 20-20-20, the rule of 20, some people called it. So it's 20 weeks in design, 20 months in implementation, 20 years in operation. So obviously we're going to spend the majority of the time of the life of the SIF and the SIS in operation and maintenance. So if we don't follow through with these concepts of doing proof testing on time, tracking the useful life, doing repairs and replacements at the right time, then of course what's going to happen is that the performance is going to degrade and we're not going to achieve that level of reliability that we were originally looking for. So how do you know if your practices are good? A lot of companies I talk to, they all think they have good site safety practices, but there's a, a means to measure this. We here at Exeter have created something called the Site Safety Index model. So it's based upon some of the concepts of 1508 and 1511. And let me say here and now, you will not find it in 1508 or 1511. It's something we've developed through the, the years we've spent going to site, understanding, doing these audits. So this site safety model is a, is a, a relative, relative way of establish, establishing where you are in terms of, of capability. And it's, it's on a, a basically five, five levels. Level zero, of course, being the worst, where hardly anything's being done according to requirements. And level four is the, the holy grail. It's where everything's done perfectly. So typically we want to try and be at the level two or the level three. Level two being good where most of the time we're doing things according to requirements and, and occasionally we might miss a few things. The best way to do this is through a, an independent site audit or there is a website you can go to called the sitesafetyindex.com where you can fill in a questionnaire as an end user and if you answer it honestly, it'll give you a relative weighting and say, OK, you're, you're effectively SSI 2, you're SSI 1 or wherever. So being able to measure this is key in understanding where the company is currently. And you can think of it in terms of a maturity. To, there, there's a journey you go through. And obviously, if you have the culture in place that fosters and encourages this, then you'll very quickly be able to improve overall practices. So it's a simple qualitative model based upon the concepts of 1508, as I said, and there are five levels, zero to four. The questionnaire is one part you can start with, but really that, if you want to follow up more detail, it's better to have a site survey done by an experienced controls engineer and safety engineer who knows what to look for. But this will at least give an indication of, of where a company is within these bands. Why is it important? Well, the Chemical Safety Board has conducted numerous investigations into causes of accidents. And again, if you've ever seen their videos, they're very good, very comprehensive. But a lot of the times it comes down to having a poor site safety culture and practices. The attitudes are not there and when you look at some of these accidents, you can see Texas City was because of poor site safety, which was poor culture in general. It turned up again in, in Macondo. Then there's been other instances where poor culture has led to problems. Because with poor culture comes the tendency to be driven by finance. So therefore, we need to save money. We need to cut corners and so on. Why do we have to do this th uh, replacement of devices just because they've come to the end of their useful life, even if they haven't failed? So again, this is something that is often misunderstood or not understood by management or people that make these decisions. The important factors that impact this, of course, when we select the equipment and do the qualification, 
we should be selecting equipment suitable not just to meet the sill requirements but also to meet the application requirements and the environmental. So if we've got severe service type applications we need to make sure that the valves are suitable for that particular application. How we do the testing during commissioning is very important to make sure that did, did they install the equipment properly, did they configure it properly? Was the validation test done correctly? Do we have written proof test procedures in place? Do we have documentation to prove that we've been doing the proof testing? And if we have any failures, do we do any diagnostic and repair according to procedures? Do we do any root cause analysis, for example? Are we tracking the useful life and making sure that we're replacing when we should? Do we have modification procedures? Do we have a management of change that we follow? And so on. So all of these things are important and will impact the overall SSI score. If we're not tracking things properly, we're not doing a good job. Why do we need to measure performance? Well, as I mentioned earlier, 1511 is a performance-based standard, not prescriptive. So we've got to be able to choose those key performance indicators that we can easily measure. For example, the proof testing. Are we doing the proof testing according to the SRS requirements? Our mean time to restore. Are we able to achieve the times we've set out in the SRS? The spurious trip, the mean time to fail safe, for example. Are we meeting those? The failures, the number of failures, and so on. So there's things that we can, we can put in place to measure. And we could also choose to use leading and lagging indicators. Lagging indicators are things that have already happened. So even if, if a, a relief valve goes off, that is an indication that all is not well, and we should count those and obviously try and reduce them. Examine the root causes. What's, why did that happen? Try and stop that from happening again. Leading indicators are indicators that will tell us that we're more or less likely to have an incident in the future. If we're not training our people properly, if we're not following procedures, if we're not doing the things that we need to do, the proof testing, etc., then of course the potential to have problems is going to be exacerbated and accelerated. The 1511 requirement now that came out in 2016 is for what they call an FSA 4, which is basically an assessment that has to be carried out periodically during operations and maintenance to make sure that we are able to track and see are we meeting target or not. So we need to collect the data and this will be related to demands as well as failures and everything else. So this is something that needs to be done and, and again most end users I've spoken to haven't been doing this so this is something that's there to help them. We can use this data if, we, if we're looking at a five-year window between our PHA revalidations, that's a good period of time to be able to collect data. We should have been able to do some proof testing. We should have any data concerning failures or demands, real or otherwise. And all of that can be used in the revalidation to check assumptions. Is our demand rate more or less than we originally thought? And then again, from the, the life cycle point of view, this balancing if we're finding that the performance is much better than we originally designed for, we could consider maybe extending the proof test interval, thereby saving some money on maintenance. And of course, we could, if we do test, do increase the test intervals, we can go back and we can look at the calculations again. So this is why the, this, this information is useful to feed back in. Also, if we're finding that the hazards are different than what we originally thought, if there are new hazards or frequencies have changed, that can also be fed back in. So it's a useful way of closing that loop from what did we originally assume and design for and what are we getting. So if we compare our actual performance with the assumed performance, of course, if our risk reduction is adequate, we just continue on collecting data. If it's inadequate, then obviously we have to investigate so if our hazard risk is higher than we expected, our frequencies are higher, 
we've got to go back to the analysis phase. If our risk reduction is more than we, we need, then we can look at how we can um, modify the design to be able to adjust to that. So back to this balancing act again. <clears throat> so the point being that the data collected, the lessons learned during the operation and maintenance can always be used in the analysis when we come back to do revalidation. Re so why would we not do it? S food for thought. So if we just sum this up then, the good thing to do is to develop an appropriate safety first culture where we have open and honest communication that any of the workers are able to highlight if they see anything that's out of the ordinary or not being done properly without being penalized, that we have competent people, we do training, we do regular assessments. All of this will build a better site safety index. Ensure that site safety is being monitored via the proper audits, of course. That's why the FSA 4 is very useful. Have proper operating and maintenance procedures in place. You can develop a safety checklist to ensure consistency. I'm a great proponent of checklists. I always use the commercial pilot analogy that even though the pilot may have flown thousands of hours, every time they get in the cockpit, they always go through their checklist to make sure they don't miss anything. Consider using leading and lagging indicators or some equivalent, as long as we have solid KPIs that are easy for us to be able to measure and then to use those to demonstrate our performance is where it should be. Make sure proof testing is conducted in line with the SRS and of course making sure that we properly and accurately record all the maintenance, maintenance activities faithfully and we're following mechanical integrity. If we use the tools, software tools, to assist in recording and auditing, auditing that's great. Just needs, needs to make sure that we're consistent in how we approach that. And also you can use tools to help with analyze failing analyze failures, false trips, and the actual SIS performance itself. As well as making sure that we undertake regular employee competence assessments. This is another requirement now in the 1511 standard, where we again use the word periodic, so you have to do periodic competency assessments. And that can be defined by the end user. If there is any incomplete maintenance or failures, to follow the mechanical integrity, this will obviously impact the integrity of the safety instrumented functions and the safety instrumented system. Proof testing, as we know, helps maintain the SIF's integrity during useful life and, of course, over the mission time of the safety instrumented system. Manufacturers recommend proof tests to give us a certain coverage factor to be able to find those potentially dangerous failures that could cause us to have a failure on demand. And of course, the relationship between the proof test interval, the mission time and the use for life is important and will also impact the integrity of the SIF if it's not understood and we're not following it. Mechanical integrity programs themselves should account for useful life and tracking and making sure that we either replace or refurbish before the end of useful life. So all of this would be done under the umbrella of a good site culture and therefore developing this necessary site safety culture is very important. I hope you found this useful and again if you have any further comments, thoughts or questions please let me know. Follow us on the usual social media and until the next time thank you for listening.